Good afternoon, Clive. Afternoon, Wayne. Hi, thank you for agreeing to speak with me. Um, I'm only going to keep you a short while, uh, as I know that you've probably got lots of other pressing matters to uh, be dealing with, and I really uh, appreciate your time. Um, I want to cut straight to the chase, if that's all right. Um, there's a number of questions I'd like to ask you about social work generally, but then specifically around anti-racism and some of the work that I'm involved in. Um, so having worked in various uh, frontline uh, youth justice, social care, social work roles over the last 20 years or so, I've witnessed firsthand uh, the impact of austerity and how it's decimated local authority budgets and services uh, and increased reliance on the private sector. I just wondered what your observations have been over that period of the last 10, 20 years and how you feel some of those trends could be addressed. Um, well, I mean, thank you, first of all, for having me on, Wayne. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I think just to go straight to your question, a lot. I think one of the problems when we look through um, the window of what's happened to um, local authorities, our education system, uh, our care sector, the social work sector, is that we tend to look at it through the lens of austerity. And clearly austerity is something that most people, uh, young people included, will have experience of. It's a, a concept that many will understand, the cuts to budgets that took place after the 2008 crash. But I think one of the problems is you, it doesn't tell the whole story. And you need to look at this through a, 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 the longer lens and look at the fact that this has been going on for, for, from before austerity. It, it even went on under my own party's uh, governance, which is this kind of concept of neoliberalism, which is of, mm. well, it's professed um, kind of structure is that you have a small state, low taxation, and then you allow businesses and so on and, and the third sector to flourish. Um, mm -hmm. What it actually has meant, has meant it's meant a decimation of public yes. services. It's seen uh, an increase in financialization, which basically means those parts of the economy which um, suck out but give no productive return back. Uh, it's seen a trickle uh, up, a uh, flood up, not the trickle down economics that we were so-called promised. Uh, and it's also seen an increasing especially recently, uh, authoritarianism in our politics. Mm. And I think when you look at it in that context, you can begin to see whether on social work, social care, uh, or any of the other issues you mentioned, there has been there has been a problem um, and, a, and, a, and a negative regret, a regression in how our society has structured itself. In effect, from the 1970s, people talk about, you know, you often hear those on the right talking about the winter of discontent. I would say we're coming up to one now. If you yes. think about the shortages and things that are taking place, if that was a Labour government, you would have heard about this for the next 50 years. But if you look at the winter discontent, that so-called winter discontent, we saw that we were one of the most, uh, one of the fairest economies in terms of the in terms of the distribution of income in our society. We've now gone to one of the unfairest um, 45 years later. So there have been vast changes that have taken place, and a lot of that has been about the shrinking of the state, the shrinking of public services, and consequently that's affected all those other areas that you mentioned. Mm, okay, so it sounds like it's more about uh, political ideology than actually um, the, the act or the concept of austerity itself. Is that right? Yeah, well, I think austerity is part of the ideology. I mean, austerity basically, there was this expression, never let a good crisis go to waste. We've seen that with the pandemic, perhaps we'll touch on that. But in, in 2008, um, the cause of the, the cause of the crash was the financial economic, the international financial economic system based on risk taking, based mm -hmm. on capital accumulation, based on um, very risky um, collections of, of debt, which were then being repackaged and repackaged and repackaged. Mm -hmm. And that collapsed. And what we were then told was actually it's 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 the public sector that mm -hmm. is the cause of this crash. We've been yes. spending too much. It's not the greed of the bankers and the financial <laughs> institutions, and uh, mm -hmm. it's actually you, the public, and your public sector, which is a which is a uh, is a redistributor of income, yeah. um, and that's the problem. So they t attempted to cut that back, and and that really was simply a kind of rocket fuel booster for for that neoliberal economic agenda, yeah. and that's what yeah. it was. So um, I, I kind of feel that if you want to look at why we are where we are, austerity isn't 
it, it's a factor, but it isn't why we are where we are. I see. Before. Yeah, it's not the root cause. Not yeah. the root cause. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. And I know that uh, obviously, you know, it was a political choice, but behind that, you know, uh, I understand what you're saying around the neoliberalism and. How do you feel then that these trends could be addressed or, you know, best case scenario begin to be reversed then? Well, I think one of the reasons, one of the things, one of the big battlegrounds now from, from in terms of race, in terms of internationalism, in terms of public sector, in terms of democracy is the climate crisis. Mm. And, you know, I'm, I'm a co-author of the Green New Deal with Caroline Lucas and we've, we've basically articulated a recipe um, for how we can get from where we are in the where our economy is now nationally and internationally to where we need to be to put ourselves on a scientifically established sustainable footing for the economy and that has massive implications for how our economy and our society is structured um, in terms of redistribution who has power and who and why the economy operates it should op operate for people and planet rather than simply the, the wealthiest 1%, which is the way that it does okay. operate. But part of it is also about these so thing called green jobs. And, and, and these green jobs, because we know jobs are going to be critical into the, into the future. Part of these good green jobs are, are not just about building new, building new um, uh, infrastructure or renewables. It's also the kind of economy we have and the kind of society we have. And we all know that there's a, uh, a care crisis if you want, mm -hmm. in terms of our ability to look after uh, our elderly properly. Yeah. And there's a crisis of social work, there's a youth crisis. And so there are number, so one of the things that, that the Green New Deal is about is about saying, what are the problems in our society and you know, in our economy? And how yeah. do we address those with the climate in mind? And so green jobs are jobs which are uh, have a low impact in terms of in consumption of resources and the output of carbon. And social workers are, are, are green jobs, in, in enhancing and increasing the number of social workers we have. The number of people in the care sector, make sure that they're well paid, that we can recruit, you know, hundreds of thousands more into that sector. These are green jobs as well. So one of the ways that we can address this uh, problem of neoliberalism, mm -hmm. which has driven the climate crisis, is to fundamentally rebalance our economy, change it, uh, and make sure that we put our country on a sustainable footing. And, and that ultimately is one of the reasons why I think the right of politics are so becoming increasingly hostile to the idea of a Green New Deal, uh, increasingly hostile of the idea of decarbonisation. Uh, and their first attempt was to ignore it. Their second attempt is what we're currently on, which is the greenwash phase, which is to basically talk the talk of sustainability, but to carry on doing what they're doing, which is destroy the planet and increasing inequality, both nationally and internationally. The next phase, which you're beginning to see from the likes of Farage, Nigel Farage and others, is outright hostility to it and to see it as a Trojan horse for socialism. I wouldn't go that far, but it would definitely mm. mean a change in power structures, who had yeah. the resources and wealth and how our economy worked and who it worked for. Uh, and so in that sense, they do see it as a threat. And, and frankly, if you are one of those vested interests, you should see it as a threat because it is. Mm. It needs to be a threat because that's what's killing us. Mm. OK, and that transformation sounds really interesting in terms of what, what's being proposed in the Green New Deal. Um, and am I right in thinking that's been published already? Yes, you can find that online. What you talked about there in terms of the different approaches by some of the other political class in terms of their tactics and their strategies uh, to stifle, um, you know, that green transformation you talked about actually reminded me of some of the um, the forces or the resistant forces in terms of anti-racism. Um, in, in social work, which we can talk about later on, but it's just interesting that that you said that. There's another dimension to the mm. whole climate narrative, which yeah. is which is the the reason you know. So there's a little bit of um, structural racism here, in the sense that the reason that we were able, one of the reasons why we were able to industrialize first and fastest, um, mm. was because we 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 went to other countries, namely Africa, um, robbed their people took them, you know, took them to plantations all over the, the new world from the Caribbean through to the Americas, um, yeah. worked them to death over hundreds of years, took that uh, vast capital accumulation and invested in the Industrial Revolution. And then that Industrial Revolution helped us to make a leap in uh, weapons technology and other technologies which then allowed us to colonise many of those countries and continue to extract uh, yes. resource from them. And in the process, we pumped billions of tonnes of carbon, continue to do so. Yeah. And we still now have an economic system which is still an extractionist economic system, um, mm -hmm. still sucking for many of those same countries. 
And yet we know the climate crisis will disproportionately and is disproportionately affecting black people all yes. around the world in all the poorest the countries. So, yeah. so there is a there is a dimen- a race dimension mm. to this, which yeah. is you know if you see all life as equal, then the climate crisis should be a priority, and us playing our part becomes increasingly important. Those that don't want to do that. Um, I also tend to be the same ones that have an issue with structural racism, which kind of leads yeah. us back to the same conversation. Sure. Yeah. Yes. And again, what you were just saying there really consolidates the view that from every which way, you know, people of colour across the world really have suffered both directly and indirectly uh, from different forms of racism. You know, there's the kind of dimension of the Industrial Revolution, as, as you've said, that also uh, links in with that. So really interesting. And we could talk all afternoon, I'm sure, but I'm not going to keep you uh, any longer than I have to. So thank you. Um, let me move on to um, what your kind of vision of the delivery of social care, social work uh, might be in a sort of post pandemic England over the next five or 10 years, you know, given the uh, the perspective, the political perspective that you have nationally and, you know, you'll have a good understanding of the direction of travel potentially. How do you think that um, social care and social work will be affected in terms of its links with the health service, for example, regulation, uh, public, private, private and voluntary sector? financial investment, any of those things that you uh, have any views on, please? Uh, I, I, I can't predict. I know where it should go. Mm. But unfortunately, you know, I, I am a Labour politician and I do have a, a pretty big beef with it, with the current Conservative government and its direction of travel uh, and where it wants to head. And, and I think that we are coming to a, a crossroads after the pandemic. Uh, I say after the pandemic, it's still ongoing. I mean, yeah. You know, scores of people dying every mm. day. Um, I think one of the things that I was involved with, but was organised, was a piece of research called Reset, um, which you can find online. Reset right. dash UK, um, yeah. and and we we questioned tens of thousands of people um, in groups, focus groups, online surveys, um, interviews, to try and work out what their priorities were in the middle of the lockdown after they had spent more after they had kind of spent more time in in, in many of them locked down at home not all of them yeah. many of them and it's amazing but whether you were whether you're older younger black white man woman whatever your background whatever your social demographic there was a an amazing consensus that people wanted to see more resource put into um, public services and key workers to ensure that they were better paid, had better resources. Okay. They wanted to see more investment in the NHS, um, mm. the associated services. They wanted to see more greener spaces. They wanted more time to spend with their family. It was basically a well-being agenda yeah. that people mm. were increasingly con- concerned about. And COVID had, had given more people time for port of thought. It's almost as if we have been and we are back on or going back on an escalator and, yeah, and yeah. you simply don't have the time to kind of it's like going past a poster about your yeah. the things that matter and you're like oh that looks oh, that yeah yeah I see what you mean yeah yeah and it's gone all before you all of a sudden the the, the escalator stopped yeah. and people were going that's really important and yeah. they're able to think about it and and so I think you know lots of you know it's interesting that it's mainly on you know the right of politics where they want us to kind of they want that escalator back on as fast as possible and yeah. not to be able to think about that. So I think, you know, look, if we were going to learn lessons from COVID, if we were going to listen to what I think an increasing number of people in this country uh, are being, I'm, we don't have time to go into detail, but generically, it would be far more on a well-being agenda and th- that green jobs agenda. And, and I keep banging on about this, but ultimately it's those it's those jobs in society which make our lives worth living, mm. that help people, uh, low carbon, but also about people, about our well-being, and, and social workers are an integral part of that because there are a lot of there are a lot of people that this system, this economic system, has broken in various ways. And if we ever to, if we ever to fix the causes, the root causes of poverty, the root causes of family breakdown, the root causes of of a lack of social cohesion, then that's going to need people, social doctors, if you want, people who can help work us through that. And until we actually begin to put the resource into that. Those problems will never be solved and fixed and, and in, in any kind of appreci- appreciable way. And that's the kind of key thing I would like to see in the next five or 10 years. And that is a big part of that well-being agenda that we're pushing 
uh, myself, Caroline, and other MPs at the moment economically. And it's a growing trend. We're already seeing, if you look at New Zealand, Jacinda Ahern, who's now you know an internationally recognised statesperson, stateswoman, um, she, you know, they have they have now legislated that the well-being agenda is integral to it's now it's now integral to the treasury budget. So when the treasury spends money, it has to it has to uh, it has to kind of take into account the well-being agenda and what that impact of that spending is on that, and, and that's the future. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's really music to my ears, and I'm sure it is to, to a lot of social workers uh, as well. Hopefully, that's something that is taken seriously by a uh, current government. Um, but you know, we'll uh, we'll wait and see uh, on that one. Yeah, I want to move on just because I've spoken generally about social work, but I suppose one of my passions um, at the moment has been around anti-racism, and that's how we connected um, via Twitter. So I'd like to just explore a few um, areas of that with yourself, if that's okay, Clive. Yeah. Um, so first and foremost, George Floyd's murder and the resurgence of the uh, BLM, Black Lives Matter movement, has impacted most, if not all, uh, people across the globe, um, particularly people of colour. And I just wondered if you could give me a little bit of insight into how the last 18 months or so has affected you, both personally and or professionally. Really. Um, yeah, I think it affected so many people in a way that we haven't seen before. And I think there was a window, is a window, has been a window that opened up, which was an opportunity for the politicians and others in society to be able to genuinely reflect on why that could happen. Um, for me personally, it, I would say it's actually been, it's actually been more painful post George Floyd's death than in many ways it was because if I feel that it sharpened the issue for what it did for me I'm yeah. someone who considered myself um, pretty woke um, in terms of that I, I thought I was already awake on the issue of yeah. being a black bloke of course. Uh, man a black person I, yeah. I kind of like yeah you know I've been around this for you know, 40 years yeah. I kind of I've seen a lot of it myself personally I've seen it happen to other people and uh, I've taken an interest in it as being a politician but I, I learned things and I had revelations after the George Floyd and the structural component especially really began to resonate and, and, and so it opened my eyes. And I think for a lot of black people and also a lot of people who uh, are angry about that awakening, um, it's, it's made the issue, I think, a lot more painful for black people in many ways, because what it's doing, it's, it's, it's making us realise that there are, there are three categories. There are those who will fight with us. There are those who will oppose and then there is a, a large number of people who will sit it out, who will still continue, despite having seen his death, yes. sit on the fence and yeah. try to sit it out. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a really painful thing to witness, you know, because it's one thing to take the knee. It's yeah. one thing to talk the talk. Mm -hmm. But if you can't follow through on that, then uh, then it's, it's, it's deeply disappointing. So I think, you know, both personally and professionally, it's it's been a revelation in so many ways but it's also been quite it's, it's it's been quite disappointing in some ways as well to see that um despite that it feels that this you know lots of people just want to crack on and, and yeah. brush back under the carpet there are those who are doing the sweeping and there are those who are lifting up the carpet yeah right? yeah that's true yeah and yeah. um I, I, that's that's for me that's been quite hurtful but it's also given me hope as well in the sense that i think there is now where we were before george floyd's death that group of people who now want to actively campaign and fight and are aware of this yeah. has grown by a large degree. And that's that's mm. that's that's really annoying those who who, who want it to continue that yeah. so to continue. And, and I think that the reason I, I take one what I will finish on this, okay. I think it potentially, depending on who writes history, but I think potentially one of Gareth Southgate's kind of uh, his letter or statement. Mm. British people in that article really wrote about why they were taking the knee. I think it will be hopefully in the future, the future that I hope we have, it will be a textbook document that, that students will look at about a turning point. Yes. Um, and and so ultimately that gives me hope for the future. Yeah. yeah you know? And yeah, you think about it, I, I just to finish on that, a lot of people I think look at Southgate and say that's that's the kind of leadership we want we Definitely. want to see our politicians aspire to yeah yes yeah 
is that possible? I wonder if that's a, another story altogether. And I know, um, you know, you need, need to get going. But do you mind if I just end on this question? And for me, I guess it's uh, particularly pertinent, given the, the work I've been doing in anti-racism. I just, you know, you describe yourself as, as woke, uh, as you said. I just wondered how you, you manage um, working alongside other politicians who describe themselves as anti-woke and who oppose the term white privilege because that must be a real challenge as you say given your perspective on the world that you talked about how do you deal with that um well it depends there are, there are, there are various um categories of, of politician and and some of them are on the extreme spectrum you know one that all everyone will know be nigel farage very difficult to engage with someone as destructive as Nigel Farage, you know, it's, it's very little in common and, and, and there's there's very little common ground um, because his objectives and agenda are entirely hostile, I think, in many ways to my own and virtually every single issue that I think we could we could think about and, and discuss. But there is a whole kind of range of people between him and me. Yes. And it depends on the, it depends on them. You know, there are, there are a lot of politicians who will consider themselves anti-woke, who you can still engage with to try in an attempt to, to win them over. There are right. others who are further away who will be more difficult for you to engage with. But, you know, the, mm. the, one of the problems that we have in politics at the moment is that we're all trapped in various specific silos. Mm. And, and one of the things about politics, is it should be about the art of persuasion and winning people over. It can be very difficult in our politics because people are entrenched and it's quite confrontational. Um, but I've always, I, I, I'm a believer in a, in a pluralistic politics which is engaging uh, and which isn't uh, stuck in silos. And, and I have to believe that whether it's just politicians or the public who are in that position, there are people who can be won over. And, yes. well, and you get it sometimes on social media. Someone's saying, I was hostile to this, this whole concept of white privilege and so on and so forth. But something has opened my eyes to it and I regret what I did and I now am on this side of the argument and that yeah. gives me reason to believe that those politicians you know are not beyond that yeah you know, that, yeah you know. I some, see. Of them, some of them are beyond the pale. yeah of course yeah some I appreciate of them it won't be and I think you know given time given different conditions different political conditions mm -hmm. some of them could, could be brought to that understanding and I think we have to bear that in mind yeah excellent that's a nice note to end on it sounds like you're living hope like i do and a lot of what you've said there is very relevant and relative really to my own situation and promoting anti-racism in social work um so thank you ever so much clive for speaking with me and um yeah i really appreciate you i really appreciate your time thank you wayne it's a pleasure